A man and his wife were not on good terms. There was problems at home and they were giving each other the silent treatment. Never a nice thing. <laughs> but then the man realises that he needs his wife to wake him up at 5am in the morning for an early morning business flight. But he doesn't want to be the first one to break the silence and therefore lose. So what does he do? He writes a note <laughs> and he leaves it in a place where he knows that his wife is going to find it. He wakes up in the morning, looks at his clock, only to discover that it's 9am, he's missed his flight, he's really late and he's about to storm downstairs to confront his wife when he sees by the side of his bed a note <laughs> written on it says, it's 5am, <laughs> wake up. Uh, we've been having a wake up call from Jesus as we've been going through Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Wake up to who you are, Christians. Wake up, dozy Christians. Don't you realise how you need to live in the light of all that God has done for you? Jesus has been giving a wake up, giving us a wake up call, and he is continuing to do that today. It is powerful. It's nothing like the note in the story. A wake up call from Jesus is powerful. He is the author of life and his voice is powerful like nothing else in all creation. Let me tell you what a wake up call from Christian is like. One time Jesus was going to a town called Nain and as he approached coming out of the town was the dead body of the only son of a widow, a young man. And there mourning was a large crowd. And as you can imagine, it was a very sad time. Jesus goes to the body of this young man. And he says, young man, I say to you, get up. And he did. And Jesus gave the son back to his mum. That's what a wake up call from Jesus is like. On another occasion, an important man called Jairus came urgently to Jesus to plead for Jesus to come back to his house because his only daughter, who's 12 years old, was critically ill. She was on the brink of death. Jesus, you must come now, please come. But then as they're on their way, a messenger from Jairus's house comes and says, it's too late. Don't bother the master, your daughter is dead. But to this grief-stricken, broken man, Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe. When Jesus gets to Jairus's house, he tells the mourners there to stop wailing. She's not dead, but sleeping. And they will laugh at Jesus because they knew that the girl was dead. But Jesus goes into the house, goes over to the still silent body of the girl, puts her cold hand into the hands that crafted the heavens. And Jesus says to the girl, my child, get up. And she did. She did. She got up. <laughs> That's what a wake up call from Jesus is like. On yet another occasion, Jesus was stood outside the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus. And he ordered for the stone that was serving as the doorway of the cave tomb to be rolled away. At which Martha, one of Lazarus's sisters, worriedly warned Jesus of the stench that would come out because Lazarus had been dead for three days by this point. But Jesus told Martha, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And so the stone is rolled away and Jesus calls into the tomb and across the void, Lazarus, come out. And he did. <laughs> Still wearing the grave clothes, he walked out of the tomb and Jesus told those startled and stunned bystanders to take the grave clothes off him and let him go. Can you see what a wake up call from Jesus is like? He speaks life into the dead. And the message today for you is rise and shine. Rise and shine. Live as light. Jesus is giving you a wake up call. We read in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 14, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. 
Those true stories of Jesus calling the dead back to life aren't merely told us to impress us, though we do certainly see Jesus' supreme power in them. It's more personal than that. The point is far more personal. They are a portrait of what Jesus has done in the life of every single believer, what he's done in your life if you are trusting in Jesus today. He has spoken life and light into your death and darkness so that you're alive in him, so that you are light in the Lord. Back in Ephesians chapter 2, we get a similar story where the Spirit through Paul tells us our own story, our own personal stories of faith. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're told, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive with Christ. And it's the same thing going on here. We're reminded of who we once were, but now who we are in Christ. In verse 8 of chapter 5, can you see it? The Spirit through Paul says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Praise God. This is who you are. Once Jesus has given you this ultimate wake-up call, it's true for every single authentic Christian. Now, it's important to notice that it doesn't say you were once in darkness, although that would be true. It's true that before we know and love Jesus, we were in the dark in the sense that we didn't have any idea of who God really is. We didn't understand who we are. We didn't know the purpose of our life. The best we could do was to guess and to grope our way around or to rely on other individuals and other in institutions. But if they're without Christ, then they're in the dark as well. So we were confused and we were lost. That's true. We were in the dark. But verse 8 is saying something deeper than that, saying more than that and something more terrible than that. Before Christ, we were darkness, not merely in darkness, but the darkness was in you. That's to say that you were not just in trouble, you were part of the problem. You were darkness, that's who you were. Now darkness is interesting, isn't it? Because it's nothing really in and of itself. Darkness is the absence of light. This tells us something deep, profound, about who we were before Jesus. The absence of light. God is light, we read in the scriptures. We were darkness. We were without God. Without God, we were without spiritual life. Without God and his spiritual life, we were without hope. Without God's light, we were without truth. We didn't know who we were. We had no meaning, no purpose. We were confused and lost. We had no goodness either. Light is synonymous. It means and represents what is good. But we were darkness, the Bible says. We had no goodness. Yes, maybe on the surface we were polite. We put on a good show of being kind and compassionate. But if we're honest, before Jesus in our hearts, we were ruled and controlled by darkness. The darkness was in us. We were without light. That's who you were. But now you are light in the Lord. Jesus has made all the difference. Jesus died on the cross for our sin. He was consumed by the darkness to overcome the darkness. And then on the third day, he came back to life, conquering the grave once and for all, making us right with God. And when you heard this amazing news of Jesus' salvation, it's as if Jesus gives you a wake-up call, the ultimate wake-up call, and you have risen to new life and you are recreated to be light in the Lord. Once we were without God, but now in Christ, what are we? Who are we? We're called dearly loved children of God. Once we're without spiritual life, but now we're made alive with Christ. Once we're without hope, we were hopeless. But now we have all the hope in all the world because we have Christ and we know we're going to be with him forever. Once we're without truth, but now 
we understand who God is. We understand who we are. We understand the meaning and purpose of our life. Now we have Christ ruling in our hearts. Once we were controlled by darkness, once evil reigned in our hearts, but now Christ rules and now we want to do what pleases him. The difference couldn't be more, more stark. Who we were and now by God's grace, who we are in Christ. Darkness and light. When we talk about two entirely different people, maybe we use the phrase, they're like chalk and cheese. Have you heard that phrase? <laughs> but if you think about it, chalk and cheese are quite a lot in common, don't they? But if you were to, if you could make a list of absolutely everything in all of creation to decide what two things are most different from one another, then I bet it would be darkness and light. And that is the case. That is the picture of who you were. Someone before Jesus and then someone who puts their trust and follows Jesus. The difference couldn't be more stark. The point is that Jesus makes all the difference. He really does. Once he has woken you up and you have believed in him, it's a radical transformation that happens in your life, in you. And I mean radical. Do you know what the word radical means? Radical has its root in Latin, rad, radix, <laughs> and it means root. That's what radical means, connected to the root. So a radical note in music is one that is connected to the root note of the key or the chord. The radical in maths is uh, in relation to the, root, the square root of a number. The radical in the study of plants is a part of the plant that is directly connected to the roots. And it's a radical change that Jesus makes in our life because it gets to the core of who we are. You see, it is a radical change. And it's radical also in the sense that it spreads out from the inside and changes the way which we live entirely. So what is a Christian? What is a Christian? It's often misunderstood. A person cannot automatically be a Christian. Even if they've grown up in a so-called Christian country, that doesn't make them a Christian. Even if they went to a church school, it doesn't make them a Christian. Not having a Christian family, not going to church, not do, reading the Bible or praying. None of that makes you a Christian. What makes someone a Christian is God shining his radically transformative light into someone's life and utterly transforming who they are, bringing them from darkness and making them light. They are a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, that's to say if anyone is truly a Christian, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Sometimes this change happens suddenly and dramatically, like the switching on of an electric light bulb. It's, it's from one moment there's darkness and the next there's, there's brightness and light. It was, certainly was like that for the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter to the Ephesians. As he was on his way to Damascus with murder in his heart to imprison or kill Christians, Jesus confronts him. Jesus met him on the road to Damascus in this dazzling light. And in that moment, there was a change. It was dramatic and it was sudden. And for some, it's a bit like that. But for many others, it's not like that. It's the same change. It is the same process of this radical transformation, but it happens in a different way. It happened in a different way for me. It was gradual. I can't pinpoint the exact moment when Jesus shone his light into my life and changed who I am. But I know that he has. It's often like that, like it is in nature with a sunrise. Just before dawn, you get the faintest glimmer, faintest change in the atmosphere where it brightens. And then the sun appears and the rays flood the skies. And then it brightens and brightens gradually more and more until the full light of day 
arrives. Night gives way to day as the light vanquishes the night. So whether it's sudden or whether it's gradual, but a Christian is someone who has had this radical change happen in them by the grace of God. Jesus has woken them up, saying, arise, shine. Now, maybe you you're listening to this and you realise that I thought I was a Christian, but I'm not a Christian. And maybe you realise you're not a Christian, but you want to be alive to God, alive with Christ. Well, the ball is in your court. Yes, it's a work of God ultimately. But from our perspective, God says well, it's over to you. The choice is yours. Will you have life in Jesus? Will you put your trust in him and follow him? Jesus said of himself, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus doesn't tell us this so that we would say, oh, that's nice. <laughs> no, he tells us this because it's an invitation to follow him, to receive the light of life. But the question is, will you? Will you rise? Will you shine? Will you have life trusting and following Jesus? Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Focusing our attention back on Ephesians now, Jesus is giving us a wake up call to, 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 to dozy Christians. Christians who are light, they have had this radical change, but they've fallen asleep, as it were. They've fallen back into their old way of life. And Jesus is saying, wake up, realise who you are, arise and shine. It is possible for us to stubbornly cling to our old way of life and it's not good it's not good we need to shine out but by doing so there is a real sense that we'll feel out of place in the world we'll feel weird when we chat with friends and family and colleagues who don't trust and follow Jesus because it's like light and darkness we're entirely different we might look the same we might sound the same have the same accents but as you live alongside them you realize you're entirely different you think differently you feel differently you have different priorities you use your money in different ways you make different choices choices that make which they think are bizarre maybe they think that you're bigoted or old-fashioned or whatever because you believe the bible i don't know we stick out when we live out who we are in Jesus, when we're woken up, we're not to drift back, we're not to be like everyone else, although it's so tempting to do that. You are children of light, so live as children of the light. We must concentrate on cultivating goodness, righteousness, truth, not focused on pleasing ourselves anymore now caught up with pleasing our Lord, who's loved us and who saved us. It's awkward, we'll stand out, and we mean we'll show others up. But that's just what light does. It's not that we're trying to catch people out or make them look bad. As we live out who we are in Jesus, we will expose the works of darkness. I heard of a Christian lady who worked in a bakery and the owner of the bakery had to install cameras to keep an eye on all the employees because food was going mysteriously missing and the owner wanted to find out who it was. Didn't tell the employees and I don't know how legal that is, but there we go, installed cameras and it turned out that every single employee had been stealing food from the company and every single employee got the sack because of it. That is, except for the Christian lady that worked there. The owner was stunned and amazed to see how this woman was incredibly trustworthy, even when she thought that no one was aware of what she was doing. She proved to be good and righteous and true all the time. 
Now, I'm not saying, of course, that all Christians are thieves in this way. Of course I'm not. And of course, Christians do mess up in big ways. But this is an example of what it means to live as a child of light, committed to goodness, to righteousness and truth, pleasing the Lord. Then in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what we're saying here. We're not trying to show people up because it makes us feel good. It makes us feel superior. No. We're to live out who we are. This is about living out our new identity, identity in Christ. And the fact of the matter is, as we do so, we will stick out like a sore thumb. I find it amazing. I find it amazing that Jesus, the light of the world, says to us who trust and follow him, you are the light of the world. That's what he says to his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. Because we're in Christ, through faith, this is who we are. In the light of the world, we are the light of the world. You see the connection? That is who we are. And as ridiculous and foolish and pointless it would be to turn on a torch and then wrap it in the tea towel and then bung it in a drawer along with spare batteries and random bits of wire. As ridiculous and pointless that would be. No good to anyone. It's as ridiculous and pointless as us being the light of the world but keeping our faith secret and living like everyone else not committed to goodness, righteousness and truth and pleasing the Lord. That is a tragedy, a personal tragedy, and it's not the way that God wants us to live. So we need to wake up. Jesus says, arise and shine, live as light. Colin Buchanan sings in a very convincing Cockney accent, there is no such thing as an invisible believer. <laughs> What's in your head's got to be on show. No, in, there is no invisible follower of Jesus. It's what you do, not just what you know. You and me, can we be invisible Christians? God says no. If you're in Christ, you've got his spirit. Folks gonna see it. Folks are gonna hear it. They might not like it, but do not fear. Let your love for God shine bright and clear. It puts it so well. Don't be an invisible Christian. There's no such thing. Live as light. Wake up. If, if your lives do not make it obvious that you're a child of God, there is a problem. As long as we think that sin and selfishness is the path to true happiness, and that following Jesus is hard, boring and miserable, we will never want to wake up. We'll always revert back to our old ways. Maybe we'll have a short season, maybe after watching a, a sermon like this one, and we put in some self-discipline and there's a change for a while, but as long as we think that sin is life-giving and Jesus is following Jesus is miserable, We'll always revert back to our old ways. It won't last. Whereas knowing what Jesus is waking us up to will change us for good. That is what will change us for good. I'm sure that there are children somewhere that spring out of bed on a school day. I'm sure there must be some, some child somewhere that loves to get out of bed, loves to wake up, and get ready for school. But that wasn't me <laughs> growing up. No, it would take my alarm clock and I'd put it on snooze a couple of times. It would take my mum at least two or three visits to get me out of bed. Why? Why was it such an effort? It's because I hated the reason I had to get up, to wake up. On the other hand, 
On Christmas Day, it was an entirely different story. It wasn't my parents who needed to wake me up. It was me who was waking up the whole family and probably the entire street. Why was I so eager to wake up? It's because I loved the reason I had to wake up, isn't it? And that this is the great reason we have to wake up, to arise and shine. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. It's lovely having rays of sun on your face, warming you, isn't it? Especially in Wales, as it's a rare experience to have. <laughs> but what is more glorious, more wonderful than that, is to have the radiance of the risen Christ shining in and through you. If you know anything true about Jesus, then you'll know that there is nothing greater than knowing him. What greater reason is there to arise and shine than to have this promise that Christ will shine on you, to know him better? Jesus is saying, wake up, know me more. Let's know him more. Let's live like him, be committed to, to goodness, to righteousness and truth and pleasing him. And finally, wake up, rise and shine also, not just to know Jesus better, but also to make Jesus known, to make him known to others. You see, there's this chain reaction that happens. Jesus, the light of the world, shines the light of God into our lives. And there's this radical transformative effect that happens at the core of our being. And that shines out into all of our lives, changing the, the, way, changing the way that we live. But we aren't the end of the chain reaction. That's not the end of the story. As we shine out, God shines his light through us into the lives of others who are darkness. And then Christ shines in them and they are radically transformed from the inside out. And they have their lives utterly transformed and they shine God's light into the lives of others. Can you see this chain reaction that occurs, as Jesus says on the Sermon of the Mount, let your light shine before others so that they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I've heard many testimonies, many personal stories of how people have come to faith in Jesus, which include the powerful impact of seeing authentic Christians living in a strange but glorious way. A strange way because it's so different to the way of living that they were used to seeing. But it was glorious at the same time and that had a powerful impact on them and it was key to them coming to faith in Jesus for themselves. May we live as light Arise and shine. Live out who you are. Live in this strange and glorious way.